Well, happy Father's Day. It is a great day. It is a great day. We have been, we've been looking at David, King David, Shepherd Boy David, and we've looked at him in lots of different ways. We, we've seen him, first of all, we've seen him as a shepherd boy uh, in, the, in the field pursuing God through his heart. We've seen him as uh, a warrior. Last week we looked at him as a warrior where he defeated Goliath by his trust and faith in the Lord. It was the Lord's battle to fight and he trusted the Lord and the Lord conquered Goliath for him. And, you know, David was also a father. He was a husband and he was a man. And today we see uh, the man side of, of David and we see David fall. And the interesting to think, the, the, the funny thing to think about today is, is that we're talking about the man that God noted two places in his word that he was a man after his own heart. And so it's easy when you think of the shepherd boy singing and writing the Psalms, and you think of the warrior throwing the sling and slaying the giant. Yes, of course God chose him. But when you see the man fall, then you start to wonder. Now, God, I know that you know what you're doing, but I'm just wondering, when I look at this man's life, he's a man after your own heart, and I'm trying to reconcile that, and I don't quite see it adding up. But what you'll find is, as we look at this a little bit closer today, what you'll find is it's not, and we've already seen a little bit of this, God did not choose David as a man after his own heart because of what he did or didn't do, or because of his lifestyle or how he lived his life. He did it because of his heart. His heart pursued him even when he was broken, even when he was sad, even when he had committed terrible things. David's heart was still to pursue God, and that's what we're going to see today. And I, I, I relate to David a little bit. Actually, I relate to David a lot. I just, I'm still married, so I didn't do some of the things that he did. But um, when I... Okay, shocker. I sin. I know, you all can't believe that. I know, right? I, it's, you just, you're just struck with the overwhelming silence to think that your pastor sins, but I do. And when I sin, the funny thing that happens is, while God remains the same and God's love remains the same, I feel distant from him. I feel like a almost like a wall goes up, you know? And he's still there, but, but I, I, like, um, I read his scripture, I read his word, and it's, it's more convicting than encouraging, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, I'm not reading that. Oh, no, I'm definitely not. Let's, let's just read Genesis 1-1, you know? Let, let's just do the easy stuff. And then, well, but when I've, when I've got sin in my life, and it's unconfessed, and I can't get, I can't get back to him, I'm trying to find my way back to him, and, and I, it's just this, this distance I feel. And, and there's, there's these other times where I'll pray, and I, maybe you've been here, like, you know what you should be praying. Father, forgive me. Or, Lord, take this hate out of my heart, or take this anger out of my life. Or, and, you know, you're praying over your breakfast or something. You just, you just can't get there, right? You know what you should be praying, but the prayers are kind of empty. They're kind of shallow. You know what I'm talking about? Because you're, you're just not quite right with him. You know, again, he's the same. I'm not talking about you're not saved anymore. I'm just saying that the sin, the enemy knows that sin in your life will cause you to move away from God. And that's not his, that's not God's desire, but that's what I, do you know what I'm talking about? Do you, can you, have you felt this in your life before? Or is it just me? Like you have something in your life. Maybe, you, maybe you've lied or you've been deceitful or you've, you've um, maybe it's a sexual sin or, or maybe you've had this, this anger thing in your life that's just taken root or this unforgiveness and you're, you're doing good otherwise, but you just got this piece of you that just keeps you from feeling connected to the Lord. Maybe like you once were, you know, you, you ever been just you and the Lord, you're like this. And then it just kind of, just kind of fades. And you want it back. It's not that you, you're not like, oh yeah, this is how life is supposed to be, distant from God, you know. 
church feels like oppression. You know, it's, that's not, it's not you go through life like that. You don't want that, you know? If they sing that song one more time, I'm just going to crawl out on my belly because that's how mad it makes me feel, right? You don't want to be there. But the enemy, oh, he's so clever. He's so clever. He'll send things, set things up. We jump into them. And then he uses this incredible weapon. Shame. Shame. You sin, I sin, and you feel that shame. Can I tell you the truth? Shame is not from the Father. Conviction, knowledge, wisdom, those are things from the Father that says, hey, <laughs> the road you're on right now, my son, is not good for you. Come, come back to me. Turn around. That's the Father. Or he stands there. Remember the, the prodigal son of the, of the father hiking up his robes to run. You know, that's a piece that gets kind of glossed over. But back then, that would have been so terrible for that man to do. He would have been showing his ankles. And he didn't care. He was hiking them up, and he's running to hug his son. Now, that's the father. Even when we sin, it's that we run away, that we feel distant. And David is such an example of this. We'll see David fall. We'll see him fall. But, but what David does so, so amazing, once he is confronted with his sin, he doesn't continue to run. He doesn't continue to, to feel shame or the weight of that. He turns and he runs to the Father. He pursues the Father's heart even in brokenness, even in sin. And I believe that one of the things that destroys our relationship with our Father God is sin in our life that we allow, that we allow to come between us. I want to read you a verse this morning because we're going to look at David. The shepherd boys become king. It says in 2 Samuel 11, 1, it says, in the spring of the year, when the kings normally go out to war, David sent Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Amorites. They destroyed the Amorite army and laid siege to the city of Rabbah. However, however, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. David is such a great lesson in passion and authenticity and asking for grace. I don't know that you really know how to pray unless you've read Psalms, because when you read Psalms, you're able to pray in a much more honest and raw way. Aside from Christ, David is perhaps the most encouraging biblical figure that we go back to because of his, his fallibility. I mean, just he was a train wreck. David was every crash and burn that we've seen in the last 50 years in sports and politics and business is all rolled up in one guy. But what I think saved David all the time is that awareness of who he was and that he had been picked and that why he was there. And, and even though David didn't know it, I think sometimes for so many of us, we're like, we wonder if we're worth it. And we're just like, hey, you do these reckless things because you just don't think you're worth anybody's time anyway. When you have this transcendent, amazing God who who makes you know that you are worth it because he created you. It allows you to pick back a wolf. Man, someone sees something in me. And I think that was, you know, David's great gift was the ability to just believe what God said when God talked about David. In my world, I believe there's a difference between those who relax and those who reload. Both require rest. The difference is intent. You know, you need rest. Everybody needs rest, right? But what are you resting for? Are you resting for the next opportunity to come up with a get-rich-quick scheme and, or, or a hack or whatever so you can just rest again? Are you resting so you can return to some high heart ridge line? You look at David and you look at where David made mistakes. It was when he was just relaxing. It was not when he was reloading. And it's, the rest isn't the difference here. It's, was he trying to get away from the fight? Or was he 
trying to rest up and get ready for the fight. And every time he relaxed instead of reloaded is when he messed up. And that's when all of us mess up, we, with the absence of that ridge line, absence of that high heart thing that we're going to. Could you tell my voice when I was quoting that? Um, what I love about that clip is the difference between resting and relaxing versus resting and reloading. Because here's, the, here's what he's asking. Are, are we resting and relaxing, looking for the next quick way to get by? Or are we resting and reloading for the next adventure? That's what that clip is about. And David does an incredible example of showing us what not to do. You see, it says that in the spring of the year when kings normally go out to war, who was David at this time? He was the... However, David stayed in Jerusalem. You see, I believe that one of the things that we fall into sin and, and, and causes us to fall into sin, and David is one of the things, that was just what I love about this story this morning, is that David is going to show us how to stay out of it, but if we happen to fall into it, how to walk through it. So to stay out of it, it's to do what you're supposed to be doing. To be where you're supposed to be. And to be with those you're supposed to be with. Amen. Right? Now you say, well, wait a minute, I don't, don't you mean sin is doing something you're not supposed to do? I know. But if you're doing what you're supposed to do, it doesn't leave room for you to do what you're not supposed to do. If you're where you're supposed to be, then you won't be where you're not supposed to be. Right? I mean, unless you're really, really, really gifted, you can't be two places at one time. So if you're where you're supposed to be, you won't be where you're not supposed to be. And if you're, who, if you're with who you're supposed to be, then you won't be with someone that you shouldn't be with. And see, David messed all that up. He's, it's just a great example. In the spring of the year, when the kings normally go out to war, David stayed home. So he wasn't doing what he was supposed to be doing. He was supposed to be going to war to lead his troops. But he stayed back in the castle. He stayed back where it was safe. He stayed back. He was relaxing, just looking for the next thing to do. He wasn't reloading for the next adventure or the next battle. Otherwise, he'd have been out He'd have been out with his men. And he wasn't with who he was supposed to be because he was supposed to be with Joab in the army. So he was not with who he was supposed to be with. And he wasn't where he was supposed to be. Those are just three simple rules that if we will live by those principles, we will stay out of sin. Because I got news for you. When you accept Jesus as, this, as the Savior of your life, the Holy Spirit, the, the Spirit of the living God comes to live inside of you. Okay, you know, okay, you're with it. The Holy Spirit. All right, fine, I'm going to go back over here. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the living God comes to live inside of you. And he comes to live inside of me. And I don't have to sin. You don't have to sin. We make bad decisions. Because we are not doing what we're supposed to be doing. We are not where we're supposed to be. And we are with people that do nothing to point us to Jesus. Mm, mm, mm. Now, if I could just nail that. I need a mirror. Where's my mirror? This is my mirror lesson. When I preach like this, I need a mirror so it just reflects back because this is not easy. It's effective, but it's not easy. But I'm telling you, if we will just get this into our minds that we need to be doing what we're supposed to be doing, we will stay out of the trap that David stayed in. Because what happened to David? Look at this. Late one afternoon, this is verse 2, 2 Samuel 11, verse 2. It says, late one afternoon after his midday rest, oh, bless his heart. Oh, bless his heart. Running a kingdom is so tired when you're at home. He need a rest in the middle of the day. It was late afternoon. He just woke up from his nap. Bless his heart. <laughs> As he looked out over the city, he, do, you not have, none of, do you not see the humor in God's word? God, like, it wasn't just enough to say David was home. 
He had to say he just shook off his blanket, took out his pacifier, and woke up from his nap. I mean, you know, I mean, I just love the word of God. Mm. Then it says that he was looking over the city. He noticed the woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. He sent someone, verse 3, sent someone to find out who she was, and and he was told, and, 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 and they said, she is Bathsheba the daughter of Elam, and and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her, and when she came to his palace, he slept with her. You just got to see that. That if he would have been where he was supposed to have been, that wouldn't have happened. If he had been doing what he was supposed to be doing, he could not have done the wrong thing. Do you see that? That's the key. And then, oh, gosh. Like, that's not enough, right? I mean, David was married, Bathsheba was married to another man, so he committed adultery with her. And like, that wasn't enough. Because then she became pregnant. And he's like, oh, what am I going to do now? Oh, I know what I'll do. I will have Uriah come home from the fight. He's out, been out in the field. He's missing his wife. I'll bring him home. So he, he sends word, and Uriah, Uriah comes home, and how you doing? Oh, we're doing good. How's the fighting? Talks about the fighting, you know, and explains everything that's going on. He says, oh, you must be tired. You should, you should go home, thinking that Uriah would go home. He'd have a little party, hang out with his wife, and he'd be covered. David would be in the clear. But somehow Uriah showed more character than his king and slept out in a barn somewhere, the next day, David's feeling all good, and, and, and they tell him that, uh, you know, Uriah didn't go home last night. So, you're, so he calls Uriah and says, hey, man, what's up? I say you could go home and see your, see your wife and go home to your family, and, and you slept in a bar. What's wrong? He said, oh, king, how could I do that? Joab, my master, my, my leader, is, he's out in the field with all the other men, and they're sleeping under the stars. How could I go home, and how could I be with my wife? Doing the right, honorable thing. He's not a king. He's what we call a grunt soldier. But look at the character that he shows. And then David's like, ah, I'm going to get him drunk off his rocker, and then we'll get it done. So they're partying. He rides like half smoked, and he goes home. No, no, he doesn't go home. You know where he goes? He's back to the barn. And David can't believe it. Because David's in a place of being where he's not supposed to be doing what he's not supposed to be doing and with people he shouldn't be with. So you know what he does? He calls Uriah in and he confesses everything. He said, Uriah, listen, I was home. I should have been with you, but I wasn't. And so I saw your wife and... Now, you know what he did? He made Uriah carry his own execution letter to Joab. And he, the, the, the thing about Uriah is, is that he did it. How do you know? Because the story goes on to tell us that Uriah went to battle and sent Joab, sent him up to the very front lines where the, where the, where the, the wall of the city was, well protected, and then they pulled back and left him by himself. You see, we have to be so careful. And and David eventually comes around, but we have to be so careful that when we have brought sin into our life, that we own our sin. We don't try and cover it up. Let me tell you something. You cannot cover it up. It will only get darker and deeper and and more of a hold on your life. We've got to own it. You know, The very first sin, the very first one, way back in the garden, is a great, great story all by itself. But when God confronted Adam, what did Adam say? Was it me? Was it me? It was the woman. And so God confronted the woman, and what did the woman say? Was it me? It was was a snake. You know, you gotta own your sin. God, I blew it. You can't lie about it. You can't be deceptive about it. You've got to own it. Well, Donnie, that's, that's hard. 
Yeah, welcome to adulting. It's hard. It's ugly. It's difficult. But this man got killed because his king wouldn't own his own sin. But then we get to the good part. Because up until this point right now, you're probably thinking to yourself, or, or maybe you're not, maybe this is just me when I was reading, but I'm thinking to myself, God, how in the world do you pick this man? And maybe you even had this thought, because I, I, I'm just transparent. I, I'm not that bad. <laughs> Feeling kind of good about myself. You know, I haven't murdered anybody. I haven't sent anybody to death. I haven't had adultery. I mean, I'm, I'm doing pretty good, all things considered. But what's the Bible say? Sin is sin. Your sin, my sin, the person that you despise is sin, the person you look down on, their sin, same as our sin. My sin's the same as David's sin. And this is why this part is so good. And this is why that when we look at David, we see this great picture of how to avoid falling into sin. But then, because he's a man after God's own heart, he shows us how to walk through it even if we fall. Look at Psalm 51. This is a psalm that David wrote after Nathan. Nathan was a prophet. After Nathan had come to David. Do you remember this story? This was so, this was, I just have to tell this really quick. I, I, I know I'm a little short on time, but you, you, Nathan the prophet comes in and he says, David, I want to tell you a story. There's a rich man, had all kinds of, of goats and sheep. And there was a poor man, had just one little sheep, and he raised it as a pet from when it was just so little. And he says, and, and David, the, the rich man had a, had a feast. And he didn't want to use any of his lambs, so he went and he took the poor man's lamb, and he, he slaughtered it, fed it to his party. And David's like, that man should be killed. Do we not sit piously like that in other people's lives? How dare they? Oh, how could they do that? Oh, I would never do that. I'm much more wise. Or how, how could they, oh, that's just disgusting. How could we even uh, let them be a part of our church or come to church? Look at the choices they've made. Look at the lifestyle they live. How, how could we ever allow them? Ah, oh, he should be killed. And Nathan says, but king, that's you. And that's how we get to Psalm 51. David says, have mercy on me, O oh God. Because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin, for I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night against you, and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say, and your judgment against me is just. That is is a man broken, kneeling before the Father, saying, God, forgive me. Forgive me. Owning it. Not making excuses. There's no excuses in there. In fact, he says that your judgment, Father, your judgment is right against me. God's not sitting there in some horrible judgment over you waiting for you so he can pound you down. God is a God of love and he's waiting. But it's our nature. This is the breaking of our human nature. Because our human nature is to say, I'm not that bad. What I did was not that awful. Or what I did is actually somebody else's fault. It's not really my fault. It's how I was brought up. It was how I was raised. It's not really my fault. I was a victim. See, that's our, that's our human nature. This breaks that. Because David says, regardless, I have sinned only against you. Now, Uriah may take exception to that. But the truth is, is that the sinning is against what the Father has, what the Father lays out as what he should be doing. And David goes against that. He makes no excuses. There is such a lesson in there. That's what breaks the grip. Listen to me. That's what breaks the grip of the enemy, of the devil in your life, is when you're willing to say, God, it is you and you alone. 
It is you and you alone. I release. I am sorry. I apologize. I move forward. But it is you, Lord, that I'm looking at right now. I bow my knee before you. I confess before you and you alone. So it breaks the power of sin in our lives. All that pushing the blame and it's somebody else's fault and it wasn't my fault. And it's, that just makes us deeper, makes us, makes us just a little bit more pliable to the enemy. Look at verse 5. For I was born a sinner. Yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. But you desire honesty from the womb, teaching me wisdom even there. Purify me from my sins and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Here's what I love about that. David knows exactly where to go when he knows he's done wrong. He's right where to go. He's, he knows, he says, he says, wash me, cleanse me. I'll be whiter than snow. Listen to that faith coming back that we talked about, knowing that the Father, that, that, the, that his Father God will love him, will wash him, will clean him, but he's coming to him asking for that alone. And this is so important right here. It says, oh, give me back my joy again. You have broken me, now let me rejoice. Don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. I don't believe that God would do any of those things. But it is a pious, arrogant heart to believe that he wouldn't. Do you see the difference? David is coming to him broken. When we sin, we come before God broken. We, that, because that's where we experience his love because he's not standing there to club you over the head and, and make you do certain things to then he'll accept you. He, he loves you right where you are, but we can't come arrogantly like what we've done against him doesn't matter or it's no big deal or it's not as bad as somebody else's. We come before him broken and that little line in verse eight that says, oh, give me back my joy again. See, that's that feeling when we sin and we become distant from him. What crushes is our joy. You ever been around Christians that smell things that are bad all the time? It was a good day in church today. It was glorious. No, I don't think so. And what are you? Oh, I, I know you. I'm not, talk, I, she, I'm not talking to her. I'm going to go over here. I promise you, I promise you that people have lo who have lost, Christians who have lost their joy have sin in their life. And I know that's a bold statement. But this, the joy of the Lord comes from the knowing him and that relationship from him. And what does it say? The joy of the Lord is my strength, right? We, we are faced with being distant from him, and now we have an opportunity to come into his presence, to be forgiven, to, to release that sin, and once again experience his joy. Verse 12 says, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. Then I will teach you I will teach your ways to rebels and they will return to you. Forgive me for shedding blood. That's Uriah. Forgive me for killing Uriah, O oh God, who saves. Then I will joyfully sing of your forgiveness. Unseal my lips, O oh Lord, that my mouth may praise you. This is just such a heart before the Father asking for forgiveness. And I just can't stress this enough that while Davis, David gives us an indirect example of how to avoid sin, he gives us this way to walk through it. But we have to be willing to do that. We have to be willing to be humble enough to come to the Lord, to, to share these things with him, and, and, to, and to be honest with him, and to own it, and to, to allow him to just forgive us and wash it. And it says, and, and I will joyfully sing of your forgiveness. Unseal my lips, O Lord, that my mouth may praise you. And then the last part here says, you done, th this, this is a little jagged, so hold on. You do not desire a sacrifice, or I would offer one. You do not want a burnt offering. 
The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and uh, a repentant heart, O oh God. Too many times, and I'm closing with this, too many times we have sin in our life, hear me, we don't want to deal with. I'll tell you one of the most common is unforgiveness. That's one of the, that's one of the worst. We don't want to deal with it. And so we don't. But we try and do other things to make it a little better. May we serve a little bit more. May we read our Bibles a little bit more. May we pray a little bit more. We try and do things to offset what we don't want to deal with. And what David is saying is that those things, that's not what you want, God. I know that, Father. What you want is you want my heart. You want my heart of brokenness. You want my heart of repentance to say, God, I am sorry. Forgive me. I don't want the, you know, it, remember that scripture? It says, we, we did this for you, Lord. We did this for you, Lord. We did this. And he said, I don't know you. Because what he wants is a spirit before him of humility. Verse 19 says, Then you will be pleased with sacrifices offered in the right spirit. The burnt offerings and the whole burnt offerings. The bulls again will be sacrificed on your altar. We're talking about, just to sum all this up, we've been talking about over the past few Sundays, knowing God deeper. Having a relationship with him that's real, right? And what we've been talking about, just knowing him, wherever you are. I mean, we're all at different places. Some of them know we, we have a very close relationship with the Lord. We've walked with the Lord for a very long time. Some of us have not. Some of us are brand new Christians. We're just getting to know the Father. I mean, we're, we're all at these different places. But all of us can go deeper. And that's what this message series is about, is looking through the eyes of David and becoming deeper with the Lord, strengthening that relationship. Have it be real. Not just on Sunday, but Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, right? That's the, that's the purpose of this message series. And so we've seen that God cares about the heart and the heart alone. Not the outward appearance, but what goes on in here. And then we've seen him that, that through faith, through trusting him, we see him conquer this overwhelming circumstance that David faced, and he'll do the same for us. And it, it deepens our relationship as we walk with him in faith. What I'm not saying is I'm not saying go out and create and, and, and perpetrate incredible, awful sin and then ask the Lord to forgive you so your relationship goes deeper. All right, I just want to be clear. We have grace, right? We have, we have grace for the things that we do wrong. But that heart, the heart of David that says, Father, I have sinned before you. Forgive me. It's not about somehow um, trying to get God to change. It's about restoring our relationship with him. And it's through that that you grow deeper with him. And the other way that you grow deeper with him is actually what David showed us in the very beginning, which is to stay out of the trap of the enemy, to, to, to be doing the things that we're supposed to be doing, to be going to the places that we're supposed to be going, and to be with the people that we're supposed to be with. That all builds relationship with the Father. It's a heart that says, above all else, Lord, Above all else, I just want to be with you. Would you stand with me this morning? <laughs> I would love to stand up here and tell you that um, I got this all figured out and it's nailed in my, in my world. But I still mess up as we all do. But I think we really start to know the Father when we, when we experience His love on the other side of repentance. When we, when we feel Him draw us back in like that prodigal son. He, we, we feel the robe and the ring and 
you know, we feel the love of the Father. And that relationship is restored. And I just want to pray over us this morning and, and just ask the Lord's blessing. And, and, and I, you know, I could do an altar call. You know I could. I could put people over here and we could start praying for your sin and we'll just do some work. But the truth is, it's really between you and the Father. That's the, that's the thing. And I, I would just encourage you with this. If you've got things in your life that you need to make right, then make them right with him. If you have people you need to forgive, you forgive them. If you need anger, if you've got anger issues, you, you deal with those before the Father. Let him love you. Father God, Lord, I pray for each person here. Each person here that, that is possibly struggling with something, Lord. Some sin in their life, some place the, the enemy has got a hold of, Lord. And every other part of their life may be just fine except for just this one piece. You know, David was a good king. But he had a peace that he struggled with, Lord. And I just pray that if that's the case for anyone here, Lord, that you would, through your spirit, prompt them, draw them to you, Lord. Your way is not to push away. Your way is to draw, to draw closer. Lord, let us hear your voice as you gently whisper, come, let me love you. Let me forgive you. May we not believe the lie of the devil and, and devil and run in shame or, or run away or put distance between you and us, Lord. But may we just step closer and closer to your presence and let you love us. For your honor and your glory, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.